Now, Church History 2, the first half of this course, Church History 1, which was from the, the Apostolic Age, from Jesus' resurrection up until pre-Reformation, was last term. And you can go back and review all of those videos that are available online. This class, we're starting with the Reformation. Actually, today we're going to start a little bit pre-Reformation because I want to review some of what we had last term and then some material we didn't deal with last term having to do with what set the stage for the Reformation to happen. And so today, in the introduction, we're going to talk about the forces that led up to the Reformation. And then next week, we are going to actually do the start of the Reformation uh, in terms of the historical start with Martin Luther. The Reformation as we know it, the Protestant Reformation that is, began, uh, the, the date that's usually marked is 1517, which is when Martin Luther nailed his 95 theses or questions to the Catholic Church on the door of the Wittenberg Cathedral. So next week we're going to look at Luther and the start of the Reformation. Week three, we will look at other reformers. There actually were other Reformation efforts going on at the same time as Luther, although he really drew the attention and got it kicked off, and we're eternally grateful for that. But um, Zwingli, who was a reformer in Switzerland at the same time as Luther, then the Anabaptists, which came along right after that, John Calvin, who's the founder of the Reform <coughs> Theology and Presbyterianism, since Lakeside Institute of Theology is independent, but we technically are registered under Lakeside Presbyterian Church, and then John Knox, who is the father of Presbyterianism. Week four, we're going to look at the growth of Protestantism overall. Week five, Catholicism and the Counter-Reformation. The Catholic Church finally got their act together and decided to fight back once they realized that the Protestant Reformation was a real thing, and so that's called the Counter-Reformation. Week six, Orthodoxy, Rationalism, and Pietism. If you don't know what those words mean, you will. And then week seven, Beyond Christendom. Christendom was the idea that there was one sort of Christian civilization that was all united. Well, with Protestantism, and then various other offshoots. There are now 2,200 different Christian churches in the world, that is, denominations or flavors. Well, once that started happening, there no longer was a concept of Christendom, this united civilization that was all one in Christ. And then week eight, we will look in the first hour at materialism in modern times, and then the final exam. I will caution you that because as in this class, as we move from 1500s to modern times, it gets more and more and more and more and more complicated. And there are more different offshoots and more things happening. I mean, it's like, it, it's, it's very difficult. And we will do the best we can to try to cover the major aspects of what happened. But modern times, in terms of the growth of Christian church and Christian history, is more complicated than ancient times, when you only had one church. and then. Orthodoxy split off and you had two, but starting this week and next week, we start talking about where the thing grows tentacles, and we end up with 2,200 different Christian churches, okay? Now, uh, before we get started with that, let's start with the question, what is church history? And again, a couple of these things we dealt with last year, uh, last term, but we need to talk about that. Church history can be defined as the story of the origin, growth, and development of the Christian faith and the Christian church starting about A.D. 30, following the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Last term, we dealt with the first Muslim of 1,500 years. Now we're going to deal with the second you know, section, which is about uh, 500 plus years. And so, but church history is the story of the church. How did it come to be? How did it grow? What were the major developments involved in it? And now, why is church history important? First, our Christian message is rooted in the fact that God entered human history in the incarnation of Jesus Christ, and Christianity is uniquely historical. Above all other religions, with the possible exception of Judaism, even Islam does not focus on the history as much, but Judaism and Christianity, the whole Judeo-Christian story, <clears throat> from the time of creation and the call of Abraham through Jesus Christ and the time since, our beliefs are firmly rooted in historical beliefs. The fact that Jesus Christ came as a real human being at a certain period in time. This is not like the Hindu religion, which talks about you know, uh, Ganesh being born, you know, an elephant born of a woman, and various other events, which nobody really tries to nail down in any particular historical event. Ours is uniquely historical, and so therefore church history is critically important to us in order to understand what our faith is all about. Secondly, the history of the church 
is the story of how God the Holy Spirit has continued to act through men and women of faith down through the years. When we study the, the, the history of the Christian church, we're studying the history of the Holy Spirit working through the people of God. And that's always worth studying. Okay? God has never, no matter how stupid we've been, God has never abandoned those who are committed to his faith. And, and I, I tell you, I have to be very honest with you, I've studied Christian history for many, many years. The more I study, the more I despair over the human condition. Because we are such horrible creatures sometimes, and sometimes no more horrible than when we look at the history of the church. It's been said that, you know, th there are no worse atrocities than the ones that men have done in the name of religion. And that's absolutely true. That doesn't mean that our beliefs are false. It just means that, you know, we're broken creatures. You know, we are, we are vessels of clay, as, as Scripture says. Thirdly, we study Christian history because by understanding our past, we're able to understand ourselves and our faith. We're able to know so many of the questions that I get as a pastor and as a teacher about, well, why do they do this? Or why has that developed? Um, the answers, nine times out of ten, are historical rather than theological. Why are Catholic priests celibate? There's a, there's a historical reason for that. Okay? Um, a lot of the questions we have about why the church is what it is and why it does what it did are because of particular historical events and facts that shaped the human experience that is the church over the last 2,000 years. And so we come to understand that and therefore understand ourselves and our faith better because of that. And the fourth reason I would give for studying church history is that a knowledge of church, church history can keep us from re repeating past mistakes and from falling into past errors. Um, We've made a lot of mistakes, and human beings, we are, we are fallen creatures, we will make further mistakes. But for heaven's sake, let's do all we can to not keep doing the same stupid things over and over again. And studying church history will at least give us that insight. You know, it's, it's been very wisely said that those who do not remember history are doomed to repeat it. And so that same thing is true of church history as with any other history. So that's why we study. Um, any questions about that? <coughs> Excuse me. Okay. I want to start now talking about some of the forces that really led to the 16th century Protestant Reformation. Leading up to the time of Luther in the early 1500s, there were a whole series of things that basically undermined and brought into question the, the theology and the morals and the whole structure of what was the Roman Catholic Church at that point. I don't, do not say that as an over, a judgment overall on the Catholic Church. I'm talking about this as a historical reality. Whether you're Protestant, Catholic, or Orthodox, there are certain historical realities we have to see. And for the two to three hundred years prior to the Re Protestant Reformation starting, the Church was in a mess. And they did a lot of really dumb things that, that caused people to say, we got to find a different way of doing this. This isn't working. And that set the stage, sort of fertilized the ground in which the Protestant Reformation grew. And that's why we want to start out looking at some of those initial problems. The 14th and 15th century especially um, was a time where the, the church was in sorry state. 14th, 15th century means 13 and 1400s. And a lot of different kinds of reform movements came along at that time. Um, some of those reform movements within the Catholic Church were only trying to deal with moral problems in the church. Things like simony which is buying a church position. Somebody who had enough money would purchase the, the right to be a bishop because if they were a bishop, they controlled all of the land of that particular episcopacy, as it's called, and therefore they had money. It was a very wealthy thing, and so they bought them. There was also nepotism, appointing your relatives to positions within the church. You know, sometimes if they were 11 years old, or if they had no, you know, if they were profligate, horrible people, they would still get appointed to positions in the church because that was a way to advance. The church was wealthy. And various other kinds of things like that came along. Um, there was a period of time in the, the, the 12th century that is sometimes referred to as the, the, um, the pornocracy, meaning there was one of the popes, one of the Nicholases, who actually took the latter, the, the, the church of St. John the Lateran. You've heard that expression? It's in Rome. Technically, since the, the Pope is the Bishop of Rome, his seat as a bishop is the Church of St. John Lateran. That's his church, and it's on the other side of Rome from where the Vatican is. 
but there's a lot of back and forth. Well, one of the popes, Nicholas, <clears throat> set it up as a brothel. He had, all, he had prostitutes there, and in fact, the word went out through Christendom that women should not try and go and visit St. Peter's See, meaning the, the chair of St. Peter in Rome, lest his, his successor rape them. He was raping pilgrim women who came. It was a horrible situation. And so, the, you know, the church was going through a horrible, horrible time. One of the worst things that happened to undermine the authority of the Roman church, and particularly of the popes, was what was called the Babylonian captivity of the papacy. We talked about this last term, but I want to go over it again and talk about it for everybody. It's a good review, and it, it, it's the best way to understand why the papacy and the Catholic Church had lost credibility at that time. Okay? In the late 1200s and into the 1300s, there had been, um, well, in the 1200s overall, the, the power of the kings in Europe, that is the secular kings, had grown so that you get various kings who decided they didn't like the fact that the Pope had been telling them what to do. In the 11th century, uh, particularly 11th and 12th century, the papacy had grown to be, without doubt, the most powerful force in the whole world. They told kings what to do. The Pope was over everything. They said, okay, you king of France or Spain or whatever, you may be in charge of earthly matters, but I'm in charge of heavenly matters, and so therefore I trump you. Well, after a while, the kings started getting more powerful, and the kings started challenging the power of the Pope. In particular, in the 13th century, a huge conflict grew between King Philip IV of France, who was a very powerful king, and Pope Boniface VIII. Particularly, this occurred over the issue of taxation of church property, and also who's in charge, who has the right to, to make the call. Well, remember, all of these Episcopal sees made a lot of money. And there was a lot of taxes involved in that. So Philip IV of France said, okay, the taxes don't get paid to the Pope anymore. They get paid to us. That is the crown. And in fact, no money can leave the country and go anywhere outside the country, like Rome, unless I say it's okay. Well, Boniface VIII and Philip IV of France were fighting back and forth and back and forth. And it ended up being all of Europe was in turmoil over this thing. Everybody was feeling backlash about this. So much so that when Boniface died, and they, they had another pope that was in there for a very short time, but in 1305, after a short-term pope uh, passed away after Boniface, they ended up saying, look, we've got to resolve this difference, so maybe we can resolve this difference between the king of France and, and the papacy by electing a Frenchman as pope. Sounded like a good idea, compromised. So they elected Clement V as pope. They elected a Frenchman who took the name Clement V. Now, Problem is that Clement, good Frenchman that he is, didn't want to leave France. He didn't want to go to Rome. You know, that's like in Italy or something. Okay, and I want to say in France. So Clement decided that he was going to live in Avignon in France. You know, you've heard of Chateauneuf de Pop. You know what Chateauneuf de Pop means? It's a wine, but it means the the house of the new Pope, Chateauneuf de Pop. Um, and so, and that's from Avignon, from that region. It's a wine producing region. So, Clement V decided he is going to stay in Avignon, in France, and in 1309, he has the whole of the papal court move to France. You know, the Vatican was sort of hollow, you know, echoing, because there was nothing there uh, anymore. Over the next, oops, i got to remember, i got to do this. Um, over the next 67 years, seven successive popes, all of them French, were elected to the papacy, and they all decided to reign from Avignon. This became known as the Babylonian captivity of the papacy. Babylonian captivity was when the Babylon conquered the southern kingdom of Judah and took all the Jews off into captivity. That's the Babylonian captivity. Well, people started referring this to this as the French Babylonian captivity of the papacy. Now, during this time, the papacy became more and more under the influence of the French crown. Basically, King Philip was doing whatever he wanted. And the Pope would say, sure, sir, you know, whatever you think. Well, that didn't go over so well with the Spanish and with the English and with the Germans and with everybody else because this was now a French papacy. So it lost credibility across all the rest of Europe. It was a time of horrible ethics 
really low spirituality, the papacy started acting like a royal court. They ate off gold dishes. They wore, they wore the most expensive of um, uh, furs, and on and on and on. They thought they were like the best of the royal courts of Europe. And it didn't go over well with the whole rest of Christendom at that point. Now, finally, in 1376, again after 67 years, Pope Gregory XI is convinced, particularly by Catherine of Siena, a wonderful woman of God, a saint, she tells Gregory he has to do something to stop this. This division, this destruction, really, of the power and, and the um, moral authority of the papacy. So she convinces Gregory XI to leave Avignon to move back to Rome. Well, he gets to Rome and starts having such conflict with some of the Roman families, at one point he wants to leave again, and she convinces him, no, 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 stick it out. Gregory dies, and the cardinals, now back in Rome, elect a successor to him, who is Urban VI, who looked like he was going to be a great guy. The minute he gets the authority as pope, he becomes impossible to work with. He starts threatening to excommunicate all the cardinals. He says, you know, anybody that's got more money than I do, is, I'm going to make sure they go to hell, and all kinds of stuff. It was just impossible. And so the cardinals, the same cardinals that elected him in less than a year from then, they leave Rome. And they go first to uh, Avignon, a different city, but then end up in Avignon. When they get to Avignon, they say, that guy should never have been pope. So they elect a new pope. Well, all of a sudden, you've got two popes, both of them elected by the same cardinals. Okay, now, give you a diagram here. I know this is a lot... Uh, you know, a lot to try to take in, so let me give you a picture. So, in Rome, you had had Boniface VIII, the one who had the big fight with Philip uh, IV of France. He died, and Benedict XI um, serves for a very short time, less than two years. At that time, they elect the first of the Avignon popes. Let's see if that's... Uh, oh, hang on a second. I have the technology. Um, Clement V, and following that, the next seven popes are all French, and they all live in Avignon. Clement V, John the Twenty Second, Benedict the Twelfth, Clement the Sixth, Innocent the Sixth, Urban the Fifth, and Gregory the Eleventh. Gregory the Eleventh is the one whom Catherine of Siena convinces to stop this nonsense, move back to Rome, where the, the head of the church is supposed to be, to reestablish the papacy in Rome. So Gregory does that. Two years later, he dies, and they elect Urban the Sixth. Okay, now Urban is now Pope, but he's so difficult to get along with <clears throat> that all the cardinals regret having elected him. The majority of them leave Rome; they go to uh, Agnani, and there they elect a new Pope, whom they name Clement the Seventh. And he decides, hey, there are these wonderful papal palaces right, you know, just across the border in France, in Avignon, so why don't I go live there, since Urban uh, VI is still in Rome. So, what, so you've got now a pope in Avignon and a pope in Rome. There had, there had previously been false popes, people who claim to be pope and are, are called anti-popes in terms of the history of the church. But the problem was, this was the first time that you had two popes, both of them elected by the same cardinals. So who's the right one? Okay, well, um, you've got Clement VII, when he goes to Avignon and he's got the cardinals that left Urban VI, well, Urban VI is still in Rome ruling, so he just appoints his own new cardinals. So now you've got two popes and two sets of cardinals. Who's in charge here? In 1389, Urban VI dies. Now, you'll notice that he, you know, he's been pope for 11 years. This isn't something that happened just a few months. After 11 years, he dies, and he is replaced by Boniface IX. Because, again, Urban had named his own cardinals, so those new cardinals in, in Rome elect a new pope. So now, you've got Clement VII in Avignon, and you've got Boniface IX in um, Rome. Then, when Clement VII in Avignon dies, his cardinals elect a new pope, name him Benedict XIII. So Benedict XIII is in Avignon, Boniface IX is in Rome. When Boniface IX dies in 1404, this has now been going on for 26 years, 
And that's, it's called the, the Great Schism, or the Western Schism, to separate it from, to, to differentiate it from the schism that was the split between Catholic and Orthodox, okay? The Western Schism. So Boniface dies in Rome in 1404, and his cardinals, reluctantly, because they, they realize this is a mess, this is just a screwed up mess, and we ought to find a way to fix this, but they don't know how to do it. So they reluctantly elect their own new pope, Innocent VII, because they're saying, well, we have to have our own pope, because if we don't, then that, you know, the guy in Avignon is going to be pope, and he shouldn't be pope, our guy should be pope. Yeah. So they elect a new pope, Innocent VII, who lives only two years and is replaced by Gregory XII. In 1409, the cardinals from both sides say, something has got to be done about this. This has gotten crazy. We've been doing this for almost three decades now. And so they say, the, the problem all along had been, people had already been saying, we need a new council. From the, the, from the time Constantine in the 300s saw there were problems in the church, he resolved it by calling a church council and getting everybody together, right? But after Constantine, it had been decided that only the pope could call it a council of the church. Well, the problem is you had two popes. Which one had authority to call a council? Finally, the two sets of cardinals that were serving those two popes said, this has got to stop. They get together and say, look, let's call a church council. And they do. They announce there's going to be a church council. Immediately, the two popes who are serving say, no, I'm going to call my own council. But neither one of them can get enough support to do that. So they both run off and hide in fortresses in different places. So the two popes are in hiding. The two groups of cardinals call a, um, a council of the church in Pisa, all right? Pisa, you know, Leaning Tower, Pisa. They resolved it to uh, end the schism. They get together and they declare that both Pope Benedict and Pope Gregory are deposed. They're no longer Pope. They didn't try to decide which one was the right Pope. They just said, whichever one is the true Pope and whichever one is the false Pope, they're both deposed. You decide which one is which. We don't care. They're both deposed. And they named Alexander V as a new pope. He lived like a year and then is followed by John XXIII. But the problem is they didn't account for the fact that neither one of the other two popes stepped down. And so now you've got three popes. Uh, back up. There you go. So now you have three popes. You've got um, Benedict the IX, Gregory the Twelfth, and Alexander V. What are you going to do? This goes on for five more years um, with these three popes, none of them willing to step down. And as I say, Alexander V dies and John XXIII comes in as his replacement. These two, Alexander V and John XXIII, are called the Pisa popes because they were named by the council, of, uh, well, Alexander was, and then was is replaced by the council at Pisa. So these are the Pisa popes. You've got the Avignon pope, and you've got the Rome pope. Can't tell the player. Can't tell the popes without a program. Um, then finally, they said enough, enough, enough. In 1414, they have another council called in Constance. They get the, the well. They get one pope, Gregory the Twelfth, agrees to resign, and he said, "I would resign all along. I promised to resign if the other guys would." Well, Gregory resigns. They deposed John the Twenty-Third, the second Pisan Pope, who thought he was going to have their support. He shows up at Constance thinking, these guys are going to affirm me. And they decided in the interim, in, the, in several years that he's been Pope, that he's not a very good guy. You know, his morals are wrong. Everything about him is wrong. And so they say, no, you're deposed. You're not Pope anymore. He runs off. They send somebody after him, capture him, drag him back to Constance. They force him to resign, and then to make sure he doesn't come back and try to claim to be pope, they throw him in prison for the rest of his life. So John the Twenty-Third resigns and is in prison. Gregory the Twelfth resigns voluntarily. He's uh, he's the and then um, the the third of the popes, um, Benedict. He runs for it and ends up in uh, along the coast of Spain at a fortress lives several more years the whole time claiming he should be pope, but nobody's listening to him, and so he doesn't have any power. And so, at the uh, Council of Constance, the two popes resign, Benedict is deposed and sort of is off, you know, exiled, and Martin V is elected, and the schism is finally resolved. 
This is what it looked like. That dotted line is where the great schism happened. The schism is, you know, the first part is the Avignon, that the, the, the Avignon popes are the Babylonian captivity of the papacy. Then when Urban is elected in 1378 and is impossible, and they elect a second pope, Clement VII, then Urban dies in 1389 and Boniface IX takes over. Then Clement dies in 1394 and Benedict XIII takes over. And then Boniface dies in Rome, and Innocent VII takes over, followed uh, a year and a half later by Gregory XII. Then they call the Council of Pisa, and Alexander V, the other two are said no longer to be pope. They are deposed, even though they don't step down. And Alexander V is named pope. Then he dies a year later, less than a year later, and John XXIII becomes the second Pisan pope. Then... Finally, they end up saying something's got to happen, and they get together in the Council of Constance. They get Gregory to resign voluntarily. They arrest John the 23rd, force him to resign to Roman jail, and Benedict the 13th is excommunicated, and he ends up in exile in Spain somewhere. And Martin V becomes in 1414 the one pope. Now, one of the reasons that this whole thing was important was because it brought the papacy, in effect, to its knees. Um, as if it, they hadn't done that for themselves. Um, prior to that, again, only the Pope could call a council of the church. The Pope had absolute authority over the council. Uh, in fact, the, the uh, Fourth Lateran Council had been called specifically to put in place all the things the Pope told them to do, and they would do whatever the Pope said. Now, this, was, this began what's called the, the conciliar movement, which means that the councils of the church were determined to have authority over even the Pope. And so the authority of the papacy was seriously reduced, and the idea was that the cardinals in the hierarchy of the church were the ones that could call the shots, even to the point of deposing popes and calling for a new pope. And they succeeded in doing that, even though they were kind of awkward in the way they do it as they went along. Okay, now, this temple, this uh, temple, Council of Constance, not only did they deal with this papal issue, but they also were trying to deal with some of the moral issues that came along, issues of... Um, of simony, of nepotism, of various other kinds of moral failings. Um, like I say, that you know that Alexander the Sixth, who was one of the Borgias, um, he openly proclaimed his children and put them in positions of authority within the church. You know, uh, even though he technically was celibate, he wasn't married, and yet you know he made counts out of some of his kids. He made bishops out of some of his kids. Um, this is the way the church was going uh, in these times. So. They were trying to deal with some of those problems, simony, uh, absenteeism, where somebody would have would be making all the money from a bishop uh, bishop position and never show up, had never seen the property they're supposed to be responsible for. Okay, so the council's trying to deal with that, and as part of trying to deal with that, they are called upon the Council of Constance in 1414 to deal with a a heresy they think from a man named John Huss. And I mention that now, I'm going to come back to him in a few minutes, uh, because that was one of the other major reform movements, but it was at the Council of Constance that they deal with what they believe is the heresy of us. And one of the most, um, unfortunate, it's not the right word, one of the most criminal acts that the, the church has ever been guilty of, because they promised him safe passage and then they burned him at the stake. Um, things were not that good back then, okay? Um, part of what happened with the conciliar movement after the Council of Constance is they said, that there needs to be regular councils. Every seven years, a new council of the church is going to meet, and they set that in stone, and they said, we're going to do that. They elected Martin V. The next council was supposed to meet uh, in Paris in 1423, and it did. Again, from 1414 to 1423, that's actually uh, nine years later. It's supposed to be over seven years, I think. They met in Paris, but the plague had hit Paris, so they moved to Siena, and they're meeting in Siena. Not a lot of people were there, Attendance was kind of low, might have had something to do with play and whatnot, but Martin basically uh, called for the thing to adjourn and everybody left. The next council was supposed to be seven years later in 1430. Martin V did not want to call this council. Now why would the Pope not want to call a council that had authority over him when the Popes previously had absolute authority over everybody? Duh, people were like that. He doesn't want to call a council, but they tell him, if he doesn't, for instance, the emperor, Sigismund, there's a Roman emperor who's German, Sigismund, who comes into this whole thing. He says, if you don't call this council, you're going to have a massive rebellion on your hand, and we'll be right back where we started. 
So reluctantly, Martin agrees to call a council, this time in Basel, and he dies, and he has a successor, Eugene IV. Eugene IV comes in and says, okay, I don't like this, I don't want to have a council, so therefore this council is uh, uh, dissolved. Sigismund said, eh, 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 can't do that. And the council refuses to leave. They refuse to adjourn. So Eugene, uh, the, the new pope, Eugene IV, withdraws his, his determination to dissolve and said, okay, we can keep meeting. Then something very significant happens. You know, at this point, it's been established that the council, the conciliar movement, it's called, does have authority over the pope. And he can't dissolve it, he can't adjourn it, he can't do anything. But something very important happens. Right at that time, when the Council of Basel, or Basel, Switzerland, is meeting, they get word from Constantinople. The Byzantine emperor in Constantinople and the patriarch, like the Pope, for the Orthodox Church, the patriarch of Constantinople both communicate with the Pope of Rome at this meeting in Basel and say, um, we're, the Turks are at our door, we need your help. And if you will come and help us, then we will rejoin the Western Church, the communion of the Roman Catholic Church. Orthodoxy will become part of, of Catholicism again, and in fact, we will acknowledge the authority of the Pope in Rome as being the primate of the whole of the Church. This is what they've been wanting for, you know, for since the 11th century. And so here it is, the 15th century, and they go, okay. One of the conditions was, we need for you guys to move your council closer to us, not from Switzerland. So they move it to Ferrara in Italy, um, and from Ferrara they begin to meet. Now, not all of the counselors, or not all of the cardinals who were in Basel, Switzerland, like this idea of being told they have to move to Ferrara. So a lot of them stay behind, and some of them move. So all of a sudden, guess what? You've got two councils. The conciliar movement, which was supposed to keep from having two popes, all of a sudden now you've got two councils. Well, the council that stayed behind in Basel, they decide they don't like being told what to do, and so they declare that Pope Eugene is deposed, and they name a new pope, Felix V. So now you've got two popes again, and it's caused by the councils, and you've got two councils. One meeting in Basel, one meeting in Ferrara. Actually, they moved from Ferrara to Florence. Uh, shortly after that. <laughs> What's wrong with you people? Okay. At that point, because the, the, the conciliar movement, the councils were responsible for this schism, the council, the conciliar movement, lost all of its authority. The, uh, meeting, the meeting in Basel, the council in Basel, started getting crazier and crazier. They were getting more and more radical. And so a lot of their members said, enough with you. And even after they, after they named a new pope, they went to Florence to meet with the other guys. Enough of them then had power, and they declared the council in Basel is deposed. The new pope Felix is deposed. Eugene uh, IV is our pope. This is our council. And the other guys kind of dissipated. But in doing so, the conciliar movement lost all of its authority, and the Pope was once again in charge. He could do whatever he wanted. So this idea, the conciliar movement was an effort to reform the church. And it failed because of human failings. And they were only concerned really with reforming moral problems, not doctrinal problems. That's important to know. They weren't trying to uh, address is transubstantiation correct, or you know, what is our view of the authority of scripture, or the magisterium. They were just worried about the practical, everyday, moral and pastoral kinds of things, including the authority of the Pope, which is not a biblical question. So, you get the idea, by 1449, uh, Felix V gave up his claim to the papacy, Eugene IV is the Pope, and once again, the Pope has complete authority, and there will be no more councils unless he decides to call one. But all of that gives you a sense of why priests and monks and ordinary people throughout Europe were going, what is wrong with you people? And you claim that you are God's representatives on earth? I mean, prior to this, the popes had gone so far as to say that they were more than human. Innocent III said, I am the intermediary between humanity and God. I am more than human. And he got away with that at that point. They'd gone from that place to where nobody trusted them anymore. Everybody thought they were out for their own, their own benefit. And that led to some other 
Reformation kinds of movements. I want to talk about those a little bit. Bless you. Uh, any questions about that? Yes, Kina. Um, can you define uh, in short sentence? Okay. The conciliar movement, what was its purpose? The idea was that a council of the church had authority over the Pope. That the Pope was not the ultimate authority in the church, but that the combined councils of the church, when they met in formal meeting, that is the cardinals and representatives from the church, that they had authority to control even the Pope. That's the conciliar movement. And it, it, that, it's sort of a play on words there, but because conciliar means council, but it also means to reconcile. And they were trying to reconcile the problem with having two Popes, and then three Popes, and then two Popes again, you know, kind of thing. All right? Yes, Mary. Oh, when they had the first council and the cardinals got together and created this council, what happened to the two sets of cardinals? Uh, they got together. The, the, it was the two sets of cardinals that finally got together and said, this has got to stop. And they came together to form the Council of Pisa oh, that elected was, Alexander and uh, the fifth and John the twenty third. So it's the cardinals that... Yeah, the cardinals them. formed the council. Okay. They're the ones that called for the council. It's like... Guys, we we got to stop fighting each other on this, and we got to come up with some solution to this because it's gone on for 30 years. And so it was the cardinals that got together, and they all formed the you know the, the new council. Yes. During the time of the schism, how did it, do we know how it worked? Like did some kings follow Clement and Benedict, and some of them follow Boniface and Innocent? Or well, interestingly enough, there was the, uh, Sigismund, who was German, was the Holy Roman Emperor at that time. He was supported by one of the popes. There were two other claimants to the Holy Roman title. Each of them had their own pope. So there were three popes, and there were three claimants to the title of Holy Roman Emperor. Various others of them, you know, like uh, the, the French king supported the pope in Avignon. French, okay? Um, the, the Spanish would tend to support Rome, because they'd always had a close relationship to the papacy in Rome. But the big thing is, here you've got the Holy Roman Emperor and two people who are claiming they should be Emperor, and they've each got their own Pope saying, oh yeah, you're right, you, you should be Emperor, you're the good guy, you know. It's really, I mean, the devil had a heyday through, through all of this, okay. But it, that, again, historically it's important because it helps us understand why the ground was laid for the Reformation to be able to work, okay. Now, I want to talk about a couple of individuals who led specific Reformation movements. I'm going to talk about the first one, and then we'll take a break, and then we'll, we'll come back. The first one I want to talk about is English. His name is John Wycliffe. You've probably heard of Wycliffe Bible translators, right? They're named after him. Um, he himself was only somewhat a Bible translator. That wasn't his main focus, although part of his theology was that the Bible should be available in the vernacular languages and put in the hands of the people. But let's talk about Wycliffe a little bit in terms of um, who he was and how this all worked in terms of his responsibilities and role. Um, Wycliffe was English, as I said. He was born in 1328 and died in 1384, which means that he lived during the Avignon Papacy. He died right around the start of the Great Schism, you know, when we had multiple popes and multiple councils, and, or multiple uh, cardinals, groups of cardinals, and that sort of thing. Um, he was a graduate of Oxford University. He went to Oxford at 15, which was fairly common in those days. He graduated from Oxford. He became an instructor in philosophy. And in fact, one of the ways in which Wycliffe's teachings took off is because he wrote treatises of philosophy. And those philosophies would be studied by universities. Like when we talk about John Huss in a minute, we'll talk about the, the University of Prague. And they started studying first Wycliffe's um, philosophical treatises, and then from there started dealing with his theological ideas as well, and that's how that spread. But he was known, John Wycliffe was known for, for great erudition, meaning a brilliant speaker, you know, wonderful arguer, uh, unflinching logic is how they describe him, and for the fact that he had no sense of humor whatsoever. You know, the guy, the guy I'm sure he couldn't tell a joke if he had to die for it. Right? No sense of humor. He, you didn't joke with this guy. He was all business, okay? all logic, all, you know, all right in your face. Now, he did become, later in his life, after being a professor, uh, and he actually served the king for a while, the king of England, as a polemicist. A polemicist is somebody whose job is to write negative things about the other guy. Right? That's your job. Um, and then he, you know, so he, he worked for the crown for a while, and then later on uh, became a parish priest and a preacher, in the 1370s, and he ended up in 1382 having a stroke, 
which limited him severely. In 1384, he had a second stroke that killed him. So he, he continued at, technically as a parish priest until his death. Now, all of this stuff about the French papacy, right? The French crown controlling the popes in Avignon. This is happening during Wycliffe's life. Well, the French papacy, the seven popes that were French, prompted English opposition to the church. The French and the English hated each other. In fact, this is leading right into the time of the 100 Years War. 100 Years War isn't really one war. It was like there were all probably 9 or 10 or 12 different smaller wars and combat, all of them having to do with conflict between the English and French over who has the right to the French throne. What happened? You remember the, the William the Conqueror, the Norman Conquest? A Frenchman conquered England. Well, when he conquered England, he started having kids in England, but he had relatives in France. Well, later on, the French confiscated Edward of England's property in, that he owned in France, and as a result, Edward said, well, you can't take my property. In fact, I have a claim to the throne. And so the Hundred Years' War was a series of small wars that had to do with who had a right to the throne of France. Was it the people living in France, or was it the English monarchs who were descended from William the Conqueror, who was French? Okay? Again, sometimes you despair of the human <laughs> idiocy over this kind of stuff. It lasted a hundred years. But during this time, the English were looking for every opportunity they could to oppose the French, and that meant oppose the Pope and the official church. They passed a number of laws. For instance, they had a law against the Pope appointing any church positions inside England. You can't appoint bishops or priests or monks. Pope, we get to do that. And there was a law that the Pope couldn't interfere in England. There was also a law that you could not, see, traditionally, if, if the government in England did something to the Catholic Church they didn't like, they would appeal to Rome, and Rome felt like they had authority. They passed a law in England that you couldn't appeal to any court outside England. That meant Rome. You couldn't appeal, or in this case, Avignon. You couldn't appeal to the Pope, somebody outside England. So there was a lot of opposition in England to the church because they saw the church as being entirely a vehicle of the French government. And for 70 years it was. They weren't making that up. Okay. Now, Wycliffe comes along, he's a professor of philosophy, very erudite, and he starts writing documents. Particularly, he, is, he becomes very popular on a couple of treatises that he writes with regard to dominion, which means the right to govern. He wrote a couple of examples, uh, one on ecclesiastical dominion, that is the church, and one on civil dominion, that means politics. In his first document, he said, Christ is our example of one who has dominion, who has authority to rule. And Christ came to serve, not to be served. So therefore, Wycliffe defined appropriate dominion, that is the appropriate use of authority, as being when a ruler rules for the sake of the people being ruled and not for himself. He says when a ruler does things for his own benefit and not for the benefit of the people he's in charge of, then that's usurpation of power and is not appropriate. It's not a proper use of authority. Now, he applied this principle to ecclesiastical authority. He said any leader in the church who taxes people for his own benefit so that he can eat off gold plates and wear ermine stoles and live in giant castles, uh, any ecclesiastical authority that taxes his people, and the bishops did, the church taxed people heavily, um, or who tries to extend their authority outside the church, the spiritual realm, and into the secular arena, either one of those cases was inappropriate, and any religious leader who tried to do that should be opposed. In other words, you have a right to fight back against that. Now, that made Wycliffe very popular with English, with English, especially the people in authority in England, because he was, he was giving them a philosophical and theological argument for why the Avignon papacy had no authority over England. And in fact, was giving them permission, because technically back then, the Pope was still you know, God's vicar on earth. And if you oppose the Pope, technically, theologically, you are in danger of hellfire. Well, Wycliffe comes along and gives the English theological and philosophical basis for them to disagree with the Pope and disobey him and be okay about that. Okay? Um, so he continues to write, he continues to develop his theories, but the problem is, well, I'll, I'll do this part first. 
Some of his radical beliefs, some of the things that got John uh, Wycliffe in trouble with the church, is he said that the true church is not the pope and the hierarchy, or magisterium it's called, of the church, but rather the true church is the invisible body of the predestined elect. Any of those who are predestined to salvation. Now, Wycliffe admitted it's hard to tell who's predestined. The only way we can, it, but he said sometimes we have to make evaluations as to who can, who's in charge, who is a legitimate authority in the church. And he said the only way that you can really evaluate people as to whether or not they are the elect of God that is part of the true church is based upon the fruits of their lives. How are, how are they living? What are the results of their lives? And he said, okay, look at the Pope. Look at a lot of the cardinals. Look at the bishops. He said, based upon that evaluation that the elect, the true church, can be evaluated in terms of leadership by the fruit of their life, that a lot of the cardinals and bishops and even popes are reprobate, which means damned. They're not saved. Um, he went on, too, to say that the Bible should be given to the true church, which means, again, the elect people of God, not the hierarchy. The church, up until this time, had continued to defend, for the most part, that, that the Bible could only be in Latin, and only, part, only the church could interpret it. We'll tell you what it means. You're not allowed to find out for yourself. Wycliffe was one of the first people who openly said the Bible should be given to the elect people of God, not just the priests and monks and popes, and that it should be in a language they can understand, because they're the true church, and that's, they're the ones that have the right to the Bible. And he then rejected transubstantiation as being inconsistent, he thought, with the doctrine of the Incarnation. Basically, he said, Jesus was both was the divine Son of God in a human form. Well, when the divine Son of God came into a human form, he did not destroy the human form. He was still a human being. In the same way, in transubstantiation said that the bread and the wine literally, completely, totally transformed from being bread and wine to being the blood and body of Christ, body and blood of Christ. And he said the bread, for instance, in the same way that Jesus, as the eternal Son of God, came into a human form but was still fully human, the presence of Christ can come into the bread and it still be really bread. If you insist that it actually has changed, which is what transubstantiation says, that was the doctrine of the church, then you are denying the basic principle on the incarnation. Okay, so he made that theological argument. Those were some of his radical beliefs in terms of the views uh, contrary to the church. Now, for those beliefs, he was repeatedly attacked. Now, especially he was attacked by, um, by the church, as you might expect, the Roman church. But he also, when he talked about authority only being legitimate when it's exercised for the sake of the people being governed and not for the sake of the person governing, when he started saying things like that, and then he said, by the way, this applies to civil things too, not just the church. All of a sudden, all of his very powerful friends, the people that really liked him at the start, started going, whoa, 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 wait a minute. Okay, uh, I'm, I, I make a lot of good money on these taxes. You can't, you know. So he started having problems on his own side, as well as from the Catholic Church. Particularly in terms of him being attacked, Pope Gregory XI issued five separate bulls against, specifically against Wycliffe. He sent them to the King of England, to the Archbishop of Canterbury, to the people at Oxford that, that were uh, the people over uh, Wycliffe and his job as professor, and on and on. A bull, by the way, is any official statement of authority in, in, uh, by a pope. It's called a bull because the, historically they came with a lead seal, and that seal in Latin is called a bulla. And so, because of the, the seal on a papal declaration called the bulla, these came to be called bulls. That's an informal name. I don't think they ever technically called them, for, uh, formally or officially called them that. But, so, Gregory XI issued five of these statements, declarations of condemnation against Wycliffe. Uh, many of his associates at Oxford started thinking he was a heretic, even declared him as a heretic, again, because nobil the nobility was having trouble with the fact that he now was causing problems for them. Um, he was incarcerated for a period of time, but he had become so prominent, so well known as a philosopher and theologian, he'd worked for the crown, that even though he was put in jail, he was put in jail comfortably, and he was still allowed to get his books and to, to study and to write, even while he was incarcerated. He was accused of instigating a peasant revolt in 1381 because he had spoken sympathetically about some of the problems that the poor had and how they were being oppressed by, remember he's writing about authority and dominion, 
that the poor suffered because those who had authority over them, both in the church and in civil government, were, were not ruling them correctly. And so because he'd spoken sympathetically, when a peasant revolt broke out, the nobility ended up putting it down, but they blamed him for that happening because he had spoken sympathetically to their goals. He was technically and officially declared a heretic and his writings were banned, but again, he was still allowed, he was allowed to, to remove himself and move back to his parish where he preached and taught. He was still allowed to study, he was still allowed to write. He was never excommunicated in his life, which means that when he died as a parish priest, he was buried in consecrated ground. Later on, the Council of Constance, remember the one that finally you know, deposed the, the three popes and elected Martin V? They declared that he was so much a heretic that he was excommunicated, you know, ex parte, you know, <laughs> after death. They dug up his body, burned it, spread the ashes in the river. Okay. We'll show you. <laughs> Apparently that made a difference to somebody. Um, and then his followers, who had come to be called Lollards, you'll read about Lollards, the people who listened to him and believed his uh, theology, his doctrines, began to travel around, sort of by ten creatures, preaching this. They became known as Lollards. Originally, it was a, um, a, a negative word, you know, because the suggestion was when they prayed, they sort of mumbled, Lollard. So it was meant to be a negative, but they, they claimed it and made it their own. Well, persecution started against these lawlers. Now, Wycliffe, apparently, or at least by all accounts, didn't really institute this for these guys to take his message around. They started doing it on their own. At first, there were a lot of nobility, a lot of, of high-level people who believed in Wycliffe. Once he got, you know, they started painting him with a negative brush. He was declared a heretic. More and more of the royalty kind of backed up the nobility and said, I don't know, we don't have anything to do with him. And so it ended up being more a movement of the, of the lower class people. And they're the ones who were traveling around preaching. Well, persecution was launched against the Lollards. Many of them were killed. Many of them were killed. Um, but they still continued. In fact, the Lollards, uh, in essence, an element of the Lollard movement, with the Wycliffe movement, continued until well into the Protestant Reformation and then was folded into uh, the Protestant movement. But a great many Lollards were executed as heretics. Um, but Wycliffe's influence was very, very significant, not only in England, but throughout the continent. And we're going to talk about that after the break, because I'm going to talk to you about John Huss, the Bohemian uh, theologian. Let's take a break. I've got a couple minutes after. Let's come back at 12 minutes after 2. So you get a full 10 minutes. 12 minutes after 2. I want to spend a little while now talking about a, a second reformer who came a generation after Wycliffe, whose name is John Huss. Sometimes you see it spelled with one S, but... Uh, I think our text spell it H-U-S-S. -S. Um, John Huss was a Bohemian, which Bohemia was always a very important center um, in, in history, but we don't use that word anymore other than talking about beatniks or whatever. <laughs> Bohemia is the Czech, what we now know as the Czech Republic in Eastern Europe, okay? So he was Czechoslovakian by being Bohemian. Um, Huss lived from 1362 to 1415, so, whereas Wycliffe lived during the Avignon Papacy and died right at the start of the Great Schism, um, we have John Huss living um, during the time of the Great Schism when we got two or three popes. By the way, the camera's still on, right? Okay, good. Um, now, Huss was the Dean of Philosophy at Prague, at Prague University, and he was appointed as preacher at the Chapel of Bethlehem in Prague. Now, the Chapel of Bethlehem was not a church. It was a chapel that had been set up by a kind of an early reformer, a long time before um, John Huss, and it was particularly set up as a place where vernacular preaching could be done. In other words, preaching in the local language. So it wasn't technically a church, because, and so it wasn't under the authority of the church. It was just a chapel. Now, that, the fact that it wasn't a, a, technically a church comes into play a little bit later. So you make note of that, that Huss was the preacher at the chapel of Bethlehem in Prague. There were close ties during this time between Oxford and the University of Prague. For instance, Edward of England had married a Bohemian princess. And so there was a strong sense of affiliation. And there were a lot of students who would transfer between Oxford and the U University of Prague. Some of those students from, from Bohemia who had gone to Oxford during the time of Wycliffe brought Wycliffe's writings back to Prague. Now remember, 
Wycliffe was a philosopher, and he wrote philosophical treatises. So initially, when they brought his writings back, they brought it back as philosophical writings. And so they started debating in the University of Prague about some of Wycliffe's philosophical premises, like the nature of dominion, which was more a philosophical question initially than it was a theological question. Um, and because of the fact that uh, John Huss was the dean of philosophy, he was one of the ones that was involved in that. Okay, so you get the introduction of Wycliffe's ideas from Oxford in England all the way to Prague in the Bo Bohemia. So this is also the time, it's important to note, when there was a growth of Czech nationalism, the idea of the Czechoslovakian people, uh, the Bohemian people at that time, uh, identifying themselves as being a nation as opposed to being a sort of a provincial backwater of the Holy Roman Emperor who was German, Sigismund. I mentioned Sigismund earlier, we'll come back to him. Uh, <clears throat> and so at the University of Prague there were a lot of German theologians and philosophers. There were also Czech scholars, uh, theologians and philosophers, and they tended to disagree with, people, with each other on things. When Wycliffe's writings were brought to Prague, University of Prague, they would argue over these things, and almost always the line, the dividing line between the two sides would be the Bohemian scholars on one side and the German scholars on the other. In fact, that conflict over issues of philosophy, including Wycliffe and others, got to the point that uh, the, the German scholars eventually, in mass, got up and left the University of Prague and went to Leipzig, in what's now, what East, Eastern Germany, to start their own university. The University of Leipzig was started by these German scholars who had been at Prague. Well, in the, in the course of them having debated Wycliffe's philosophy, at one point in the heat of argument, one of, one of the Czech, uh, or one of the German scholars at one point, had said, well, by the way, you do know that this guy you're arguing for is a heretic. And so the issue of Wycliffe's theology came into the arguments. And so when the German scholars all decided to leave the University of Prague and go and start a new university in Leipzig, when they laughed, they, they said, and by the way, you're all heretics. And so the word spread that all the people in, in uh, Bohemia, all the people in Prague, the scholars were all heretics because they had defended Wycliffe's philosophy, even though there are some of his theological points, for instance, like transubstantiation, John Huss did not agree with. He still maintained uh, the traditional or orthodox idea about transubstantiation against Wycliffe's idea. But because he not only was a professor of philosophy, and in fact the dean of the School of Philosophy, he also was a preacher every week at the Chapel of Bethlehem, Huss started preaching on moral uh, reform not doctrinal reform. You remember that I talked about the conciliar movement. They weren't trying to reform Catholic doctrine. They were trying to, to deal with moral and pastoral issues, like simony, like absenteeism, you know, like nepotism. And so Huss started preaching in this way. For instance, one of, the, one of his popular topics was he would talk about God's fat ones, he called it, which meant priests and monks who had gotten fat off the prophets from their church positions and were living in luxury. And so a lot of his discussion, his preaching, had to do with the dangers of uh, luxurious lifestyle and having the wrong priorities, etc. Because he was dealing with moral things, he preached against simony. Now you remember, simony was when a person paid to get a church position. They paid a lot of money, usually, to get a position as a bishop. Well, that sort of church touched a nerve because the Archbishop of Prague, whose name was uh, Zabinik, I don't speak Czech, so Zabinik, I'm guessing it is, um, he had purchased his position. And so that really touched a nerve. Here you've got Huss, this Dean of Philosophy from the University of Prague, preaching this stuff and practically you know, pointing his finger in the Archbishop's nose in Prague. Well, as a result of that, the Archbishop asks the Pope Alexander V, which was the first of the Pisan Popes, you know, he was appointed by the Council of Pisa, he asked Alexander V for help against Huss. Well, the response from Alexander V was that he forbade any preaching anywhere except in churches and monasteries. The chapel of Bethlehem where Huss preached was not a church. It was not a monastery, it was a chapel which technically, that meant he was no longer allowed to preach. After much soul-searching, John Huss decided he wasn't going to obey that rule. 
And he openly disobeyed and continued to preach at the chapel and continued to poke Archbishop Zabednik right in the nose about some of the other things going on in the church. Well, in 1410, Rome ordered, that is the Pope, ordered uh, Huss to appear in Rome to answer for his disobedience, for not obeying when he was told by the Pope, you have to stop preaching. But he refuses to go. He says, I'm not going to do that. In fact, it was at that point that he really crossed a line and he declared that an unworthy Pope did not have to be obeyed. Um, you begin to see where this is going. So some of John Huss's radical beliefs was first, an unworthy pope, again, did not have to be obeyed, that the Bible is the ultimate authority, and that a pope who does not obey the Bible should not be obeyed. Uh, Huss said that only God can grant forgiveness, and so papal indulgences for forgiveness of sin are against the faith. Because, the, the um, for instance, one of the things that happened here is that one of the popes decided he was going to create a little war, and he was going to, you know, for political advantage in Italy, and he was going to fund it by selling indulgences. Well, that really set John Huss off, and he's saying, you know, not only is it immoral to fund a war, which the pope is fighting for political reasons, not for spiritual reasons, and to fund it by selling the promise of being forgiven of your sins and letting it, being let out of purgatory early. Only God can forgive sins. The Pope is sinning when he's trying to sell for money indulgences that say you will be forgiven. Uh, John Huss also maintained several other points which became important later after Huss's death, that the Word of God should be preached freely. Remember, they told him he couldn't preach except in a church. It should be pre preached freely and it should be preached in the vernacular, meaning in the Czech language, or the German language, or the Italian language, or whatever it is that the people spoke. He also maintained that communion should be in both kinds. Up until this point, in the Catholic Church, the, um, you know, there's the bread and the, and the wine. Well, the people were offered the bread, but only the priest drank the wine. <laughs> that only the priest was allowed to consume the blood of Christ. Well, one of the arguments in the, in the pre-Reformation and Reformation was that the people have a right to both aspects, both elements of the communion not just one. And that um, Huss maintained that clergy should not be allowed to be wealthy, they should not be allowed to hold public office, uh, that there should be a, a sense of responsibility to an ecclesiastical position that meant you don't get rich doing this. I'm right there. Uh, so this was, a, this was a major point for him. And he said, if a person sins, they should be punished. And they should, appropriately, not irrationally, but they should be uh, punished appropriately, no matter who does it, even the Pope. Because the Popes have been notorious and very open about, about their sins, sins of fornication, of, you know, of all kinds of stuff, and thought that, hey, I'm God's vicar on earth, you can't tell me I can't do that if I want to do it. And it got very bad. So these are some of the radical beliefs that John Huss, and we hear this today and go, well, duh. Well, <laughs> these were fighting words back then. There was one church, not counting the Eastern Orthodox, but in the West there was one church, and like Wycliffe, John Huss was saying, you guys got it wrong, and you need to change. So, Huss was excommunicated twice. Yes. First by Alexander V, and then later by John XXIII. Both of them later got declared anti-popes. These are both of the Pisan popes, the popes that were declared in Pisa. You may wonder why there's John the 23rd here, and then in the 20th century, the Second Vatican Council was called by John the 23rd. When these guys were declared anti-popes, both of those titles, Alexander V and John the 23rd, were no longer considered having been used, and so they were next in line. When John the 23rd decided he wanted to take the name John, the next number in the John order was 23. And so we've had more than one John the 23rd because these two guys were officially declared anti-popes. But I, I find it fascinating that, that they both excommunicated us, like, well, what, the first one didn't take? <laughs> it's a, it's, you just wonder what they're thinking. Um, now, at this point, with all of the controversy going on, um, the Council of Constance is called in 1414. Now, everybody knew this was going to be important. This was going to be, this is going to be the second attempt. The Council of Pisa tried to stop the Great Schism and made it worse by appointing a third pope. 
Now there was determination on the part of all the cardinals and the church that they were going to resolve this issue of the Great Schism. They were calling a great council at Constance. They were going to deal with all kinds of issues in addition to the multiple popes. Um, and so there was a sense, a widespread sense, that this council was going to be the biggest thing to come along in a long, 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 long time. And that it was something that was going to be really important. Well, the Holy Roman Emperor Sigismund invited John Huss to come to the Council of Constance to defend his views, and he promised John Huss that he would be given safe, safe passage. He could come there and then leave. Nothing would happen to him. Nobody would do anything to him. He was safe. Um, and John Huss, because these, you know this was his whole life, and he thought this council was going to be critical to changing the church, reforming the church, getting it in the right direction, he felt like he needed to be there. And so he went. Immediately when he arrived, he starts getting ordered to recant of his heresy. In fact, he's arrested. He is ordered to recant. Uh, when, he re when he finally says, I don't, uh, show me what I need to recant. Show me, show me where I'm a heretic. And at one point, they're making all these accusations. And he says, none of the things you're accusing me of are things I've said. Would you tell me what it is I'm supposed to have done? And they wouldn't answer him. They just kept saying, you have to recant. You have to recant. You must recant. And he finally said, I don't know what you people want. So, in uh, 14, this is in 1415 now, they take him, dress him in his priestly robes, and then tear them off of his body. They shave his head. They put a paper crown with demons drawn on it on his head. They march him out past uh, a bonfire where they're burning his books, and they tie him to the stake, and they burn him alive. Uh, the whole time this is going on, Sigismund, the Holy Roman Emperor, who had promised safe passage, is standing by. In fact, he's standing by because he decided once Hus got there, so many people were speaking against him, he thought, hey, this is a losing horse. I'm not going to back him anymore. Even though he promised him he would be safe. And so Sigismund sat there and twiddled his thumbs. In fact, there's one story, which some, some scholars give credence to, that when, um, when John the 23rd, who was the Pisan Pope that thought he was going to get confirmed at the Council of Constance, and when they started making it clear he wasn't, when he ran for it, the story is that when John the 23rd was getting ready to run out of town, he gave the keys to John Huss's cell to the Emperor Sigismund and told him you can let him go. And instead, Sigismund had it transferred to a more secure cell to hold him until he could be uh, executed. So this is in uh, June, early July of 1415. July 6th of 1415 is when he's finally burned. Now, at the last chance when they asked him to recant, he said this, I appeal to Jesus Christ, the only judge who is almighty and completely just. In his hands I place my cause, since he will judge each, not on the basis of false witnesses and erring counsels, but on truth and justice. When they actually lit the fires, he prayed, Lord Jesus, it is for thee that I have patiently endured this cruel death. I pray thee to have mercy on my enemies. And then he was quoting the Psalms as he died. One of the most horrible times ever in terms of the history of the church and the horrible things that the church has done. Uh, and there have been a few. <laughs> they also, uh, at a few days later, they burned one of his, uh, one of Huss's closest followers, who was called Jerome of Prague, they burned him at the stake as well. They gathered all of the ashes from, um, from Huss's, after Huss was burned, and Jerome of, of Prague, and they scattered it in the lake. But there were checks there, and after dark, they went and dug up the ground where they had been burned and took soil back to Bohemia uh, to honor the fact that he had suffered, you know, he'd been promised safe passage and was murdered um, there at the Council of Constance. Now, the suggestion historically is that the Council of Constance really did not want to execute him. They wanted him to say something to, uh, because the Council of Constance, in addition to dealing with the issue of the Pope, they felt like they had to do something to try to set a higher moral and theological standard for the church. They thought, okay, we have an opportunity now, not only to straighten out this great schism problem, but also to set the church on a new path. Well, this John Huss had created um, a, a scene in the church and was saying things that were contrary to the doctrine of the church. So they were looking for him to say anything that would give them an excuse for saying, okay, we've dealt with this now, it's all done, but he wouldn't recant. Primarily he wouldn't recant because 
even though they probably would have let him go if he had, if he had said, okay, yeah, I've been a heretic. They probably would have said, okay, do ten Hail Marys and you can go. But he knew that if he said, I'm a heretic, then all of his followers back in Bohemia would be potentially victimized as heretics as well. Because if he was a heretic, they were too. And he was not going to do that to them. And so he went to the stake. Um, it was a horrible situation. Now, back in Bohemia, when word comes to Bohemia that he has been burned at the stake, they are unanimously <laughs> indignant, and they repudiate everything that the Council of Constance had said. 452 Bohemian noblemen gathered together in assembly and announced that they agreed with Huss, they approved of his theology, they, they recanted their association with the Council of Constance if that was going to be what the Catholic Church was. Um, several different groups came together at that time in support of what John Huss had not only taught but represented. Um, those were everything from the noblemen, as I say, over 450 noblemen, down to very common people. There were, there were a couple of specialized kind of, kind of apocalyptic groups, sort of like wild-eyed, you know, apocalyptic. Uh, the Taborites was one group. There was another group called the Horobites. Now, they're important because the Taborites believed that the end could come at any moment, and they were prepared to do whatever they could to get ready for the kingdom of God. And so that ended up making them very fierce warriors. And that comes into play here because what happens is the, uh, the, the Bohemians that supported Huss got together, and they came up with what they called the four articles of their faith. Those four articles were, and they believed that th these were consistent with Huss's teaching. One, that the Word of God needs to be able to be preached freely and in the vernacular. Again, secondly, that the communion needs to be in both kinds to all people, both the bread and the cup. Third, that the clergy is not to be wealthy or to serve in public office, but to be committed to uh, you know, modest income in service of the church. And fourth, that uh, any gross and public sin must be punished. These are the four articles that they declare. Now, this, the strange thing happened after that. They declared that those four articles were absolutely required. About that time, and I didn't even mention this to you, the king of Bohemia was King Wenceslaus. Not that King Wenceslaus. The, you know, the, the hymn, uh, Old King Wenceslaus was down. That was actually a duke, a Bohemian duke from like 300 years earlier. This King Wenceslaus was the half-brother to King Sigismund, the emperor, the emperor Sigismund, the one who'd been responsible really for Huss's death. Well, Wenceslaus supported one of the other popes a different one than Sigismund, because Wenceslaus actually had been a claimant to the throne of the Holy Roman Empire, and Sigismund had deposed him and taken over by, by force. So Wenceslaus didn't like his half-brother, and so there's a lot of competition going on there. Well, Wenceslaus dies, the next person who is the heir to the throne of Bohemia, because they've got their own king, is none other than the Emperor Sigismund. And in those days, they didn't you know, I can be emperor and king at the same time. So he comes in to become king of Bohemia. All of the noblemen who have agreed to the four articles of faith and supported Huss say, we won't let you be our king unless you agree to the four articles of faith and you promise you're not going to appoint any Germans to any position of authority. I'm sorry about Plinky, he's not here because I always love to draw the German thing in this <laughs> So these Bohemians said, no Germans in positions of, of authority in public position and you have to agree to the four articles of faith. Well, um, Sigismund says, no, I don't agree to that. And he calls for the Pope, I don't even know which one it was at this point. He calls for the Pope to declare a crusade against the Bohemians. So the Pope declares a crusade. Emperor Sigismund gets his army together and he marches toward Prague to forcibly put down these rebellious Hussites, followers of Huss and Bohemia. Now, at that point, uh, there was a junior nobleman named John Ziska. John Ziska was something of a military genius. He had taken over responsibility for the Bohemian army, had gotten a bunch of these, uh, these the Taborites, this sort of radical militant apocalyptic sect of the, of the uh, believers back then. He had organized them into an army and done a really good job. And one of the strange things he did, which was very effective, the peasants had these two-wheeled carts that everybody used. 
He took those two wheel, two wheel carts and put blades on them and turned them into war chariots. Well, when Sigismund and his army walk, uh, march in, John Siska and the Taborite army with their war chariots <laughs> demolish them. So Sigismund backs up, he reorganizes himself, he comes at them again. The complete army is destroyed. The Bohemians destroy them. Well, they, later on, uh, to, to give you the short version of this, they continue to declare crusades against the Bohemians because they're heretics, right? And Sigismund the Emperor wants to take over his king. They attack the Bohemians in 1420, 1421, 1422, 1427, and 1431, five different crusades, and get demolished by these Bohemians every single time. They can't win a battle. So finally, the Council of Basel comes along. Okay, we talked about the Council of Basel. You know, they, they, uh, the Council of Basel comes along, and they say, okay, the Council of Constance did not deal with this whole Bohemian controversy very well. So let's start all over again. We want to talk to you guys about this. So Bohemian guys, send some people to our council. We'll talk about it. And they go, really? <laughs> you remember what happened last time one of our people showed up at one of your councils? We're not coming there. Forget that. So the Council of Basel declares another crusade, and they send another army in. And guess what happens? They get their backsides kicked by the Bohemians. Again, twice more that happens. And so finally, the Catholic Church says, okay, <laughs> um, you guys can keep your four articles of faith, and you can come back into the Catholic Church, and we'll leave you alone. And they go, okay. And so part of the Bohemian followers of Huss come back into the Western Catholic Communion, but are allowed to keep doing things the way they want to do it. They're allowed to preach anywhere they want, in the vernacular, communion is offered in both kinds, you know, they have control over whether the clergy are doing the wrong things in their, in their areas, et cetera, et cetera. So the Catholic Church gives in on everything, lets them come back, but not all of them. Some of the Bohemians, decide that they want to stay away from the Catholic Church now, and they create what's called the Unitas Fratrum, or the Union of Brethren. This Union of Brethren, which are following the four articles of faith and the principles that Wycliffe had and that John Huss had, they start to grow, not only in Bohemia, but in next door in the area known as Moravia. They continue to grow. When the Protestant Reformation comes along in the 16th century, they establish close links with Protestantism. Some of them actually uh, become Calvinists under the Reformed tradition. Others of them uh, continue sort of as their own denomination. They're heavily persecuted by the Habsburg emperors um, who were supporters of, of Roman Catholicism. But this union of brethren in, um, in Bohemia and Moravia later on became known as the Moravian Brethren. You heard of the Moravian Brethren? It is a denomination. Um, and so they ended up being, um, you know, a couple of different forms of this Moravian Brethren were established after that, but they did maintain their independence. Some of them went back into the Catholic Church, and the Catholic Church left them alone because they'd already whipped the Catholic armies like seven times, and they decided not to mess with them anymore. Okay? <coughs> so, you see through um, the awful things that the Catholic Church was doing, and there were clear movements, Wycliffe, Huss, and others who came along, that really proposed what were the precursors of the Protestant Reformation in the century before um, Luther and the other reformers come along. I want to talk about one other person who was inside the Catholic Church, who worked very hard to reform it from the inside, and who had great success for a while and then was, you know, was suppressed. His name is Girolamo Savonarola. You know, have you ever heard of Savonarola? A lot of people have this bad idea. He's been represented in movies as being like this crazy monk, and not at all. Okay, let me tell you about him. Um, Savonarola was Italian. Um, he lived from 1452 to 1498. Most of the time, um, he lived in Florence, although he had not been born in Florence. I think he was born in Crete, if I remember correctly. He came to Florence in 1490. And there he joined the monastery of St. Mark. And so he was a monk, um, a Dominican monk. He started right away when he joined the monastery to begin to offer a series of lectures for the monks on scripture. And they were lectures at first. 
Well, these lectures were so well received that other people heard about them and asked, could we start coming? So he had lay people and priests and others coming and listening to his lectures on scripture. Well, in less than a year, these things have become so popular, they asked him if he would do them in larger places. And eventually, he was asked, in around Lent of 1491, he was asked if he would actually preach at the main church in Florence, which he started doing. And his lectures sort of evolved from being lectures into being sermons right, during that time. He particularly focused on the evils that were present in, in those times. He contrasted the Christian life with the love of luxury that so many Christians experienced. And again, he's, he's addressing these moral issues. Again, many of them inside the church, but also within the public. That is, people who claim to be followers of Christ as lay people, but who did not live that way. Well, he had come to Florence originally, sort of at the invitation of Lorenzo de' Medici, Lorenzo the Magnificent. The Medici's controlled Florence and other large parts of Italy at that point. Well, when, um, sort of like when John Huss started preaching and the, the archbishop was guilty of simony and he, you know, he got full both barrels, the same thing is true as when uh, uh, Savonarola is preaching about wealth and luxury and how damaging that is and how you can't be a true Christian if you give in to all those things. Well, Lorenzo de' Medici and other very powerful people didn't like it. And they start trying to oppose Savonarola. But unfortunately by that time, for, unfortunately for Lorenzo de' Medici, the other people in the city, the city of Florence, were really supporting Savonarola. They really liked him. They thought he was right. And so they told Lorenzo de' Medici where to get off. You know, forget it. So um, at this point Savonarola completely has the support of the people of Florence. He is elected as the, um, the prior, you know, the main abbot, of the Monastery of St. Mark, and he starts a program of reform in that monastery, in which the, the monks are led both to scholarship, he insists that they learn Latin and Greek and Hebrew and Chaldean, and he forces them to study, he also forces them into acts of service and of holiness, and in fact, in fairly short order, the monks of St. Mark became so well known for their holiness and for their spirits of service that everybody was impressed. In fact, other monasteries were contacting them saying, can you help us reform ourselves in the same way? And even though Lorenzo de' Medici, for instance, considered Savonarola an enemy, he was seen as so pious that when, uh, when Lorenzo was on his deathbed, he asked for Savonarola to come to him, to comfort him on his deathbed. So he was really making a spiritual impact within the Catholic Church. Um, when Lorenzo died, his heir was Pietro de' Medici, and Pietro de' Medici was not well liked. At that point, Charles VIII of France is marching to Naples to take over as king of Naples. Well, Florence is right in his path. And armies, you know, you had to keep your armies busy. If there's a major city in your path, you might as well take it. Okay? <laughs> and so they're afraid that Charles VIII is going to destroy Florence. Well, Pietro de' Medici. Um, is completely ineffective in trying to deal with this. In fact, he's so ineffective and he's so offensive in how he wants to approach it that the Florentines throw him out of the city. Say, get out of here, you're not in charge anymore. And Savonarola goes out and negotiates with Charles VIII. And Charles VIII has all these horrendous demands that he wants from Florence in order to keep him destroying it. Savonarola negotiates a much easier set, so much so that the people of Florence fall in love with this guy, not only for religious reasons, but for political reasons. And they say, okay, we, we need to set up a new government. We just threw the main guy out. We need to set up a new government. Savonarola, who do you, what do you think we ought to have as our government? He recommended they set up a republic, all right? That they have elected officials, not that they've got just one guy who's running it. And they do it. And they say, what else should we do? And Savonarola says, you need to take all the gold and silver that you've got lining all these things in the churches and use it to feed the poor. When he had become abbot of St. Mark's Monastery, he had sold large tracts of land that were not being used and used the money to feed the poor. So he was very compassionate in these kind of things. Um, and again, he believed very much that the, the church needed to study and it needed to serve. That's what the church needed to be about. Now, one of the things he did that has gotten some attention, you all remember the movie Bonfire of the Vanities? That expression, bonfire of the vanities, comes from Savonarola. What he did in Florence is he set up this wooden pyramid in the city and put uh, wood, um, 
tin, tinder and, and firewood and laced with gunpowder and everything underneath it, and it had steps. And he encouraged the people of the city, especially the wealthy people, to think about all of the vanities. And what he meant by a vanity was anything that is an item of luxury that you love more than you should. And he told them to, to identify the vanities in their life and bring them out and set, them, set these things. Now, it could be uh, ornate, expensive furniture or wigs or jewelry or anything else. Whatever it was that you were too attached to and it kept you from serving and lo loving and serving God the way you should, those were the vanities in your life. Bring them out, set them up here, and then regularly they would set fire to this, this pyramid, and that was the bonfire of the vanities. And so, and people were doing this. They weren't forced to. This was voluntary. But Savonarola's preaching was so effective that people were convicted about the fact that they were putting other things in front of God, and they were moving to try to get rid of those things, okay? Um, Excuse and, me. Yes? Was there a large group of people who did this? Or? Yeah, they did it multiple times. I mean, it happened over a period of time. Mm -hmm. uh, so, and it was expensive dresses, and like I say, wigs, and furniture, and whatever it was that people became convicted by the Spirit that these things are keeping me from, from focusing on God. And so, and this, again, this became... The tradition on this, or if you if you read novels or whatever that refer to the bonfire of the vanities, and they give you this sense that he was some sort of tyrannical dictator and he forced people to do this. No, he didn't. He preached it, and they were convicted and did it voluntarily. Okay, it was not anything that he was doing to oppress people. He was they were responding to what his preaching caused them to feel the conviction in this way. I think he was a great guy, in other words. Okay? And yet he has a reputation in some movies and stories and things like that as being this sort of maniacal, um, kind of stupid monk, you know, who was, who was so bent on doing these oppressive things, he didn't think about it. Well, this is the guy that insisted that they learn Chaldean in the monasteries, for instance. He was very, very intelligent. Now, he then spread his uh, reformation, you know, his, his moral reformation from Florence to other cities particularly in Pisa, although we got some opposition from some of the monks in Pisa, and also to Siena. There were several places where the monasteries uh, that in this area that he came to, some of them welcomed him and it went really well. Some of them he would go in and if the monks refused to, to agree to this and be obedient, he would have them thrown out of the monasteries. So he had some enemies because he said, if you're going to be a monk, you've got to live a certain way. And if you're not up for that, then you shouldn't be a monk. Go find something else to do with your time. So he didn't, you know, he wasn't that patient with that sort of thing. But finally, ultimately, Savonarola's downfall was not for any of the moral reasons or religious reasons. It really was political. Um, what happened was, as I mentioned, when Charles VIII marched through and Savonarola negotiated with him, protected the city of Florence, and everybody was so grateful at the time, later on, um, one of the popes, Alexander VI, who was a Borgia, Alexander VI was one of the ones who, you know, he, he, he's one of the ones I mentioned earlier who, who took his illegitimate children and gave them positions of authority in the church and his counts and everything else. He's a horrible guy, one of the worst popes ever. He, for political reasons, wanted to uh, declare war on France. And he got some Italians and all sorts of other people. And Florence was a major city in Italy. And he said, okay, Florence, you need to back me on this. Now, these are all city-states at that point. They're independent. There's not a nation of Italy. And so the city-state of Florence, he said, I need you to support me in this. Well, Savonarola had given his word to Charles VIII as part of the negotiations when Charles, the king of France, came through and said, we won't go to war with you. And so Savonarola said, no, we gave our word, and we're not going to break that. Well, the pope is so angry at not being supported that at first he, uh, he declares harsh measures against Savonarola, but then he applies it to the whole city. He puts in an interdiction which means nobody was supposed to offer communion within the city, and nobody was allowed to trade with Florence. Well, that started hurting people's pocketbooks. And when it started hurting people's pocketbooks, the wealthy people decided, we're having a problem with this economically simply because our preacher doesn't want to, you know, doesn't want to break his word. And so Savonarola came under criticism from the wealthy, and the wealthy appealed to Rome, and they ended up... Uh, storming St. Mark's Monastery and arresting Savonarola. Savonarola did not defend himself. He would not allow his friends to defend him, so, to, to defend him because he said, I will not have Florentines fighting fellow Florentines on my behalf. 
and so he allowed himself to be arrested without opposition. Um, he was taken into custody, and then they said, okay, we have to find something to accuse him of. <laughs> and so they start torturing him. And first the people of Florence torture him, and they can't get him to confess to anything. And the Pope sends some of his legates to help with the torture, so they torture him for quite a while. The only things he ever confesses are, one, I can't tell the future. But he had never claimed to tell the future. Now the reason that was an issue is because the wealthy people got mad because their pocketbooks were being hurt. But around the same time, the, the poor people, the simple people, began to think so much of Savonarola, they thought he could do miracles. And the, so they were saying, do miracles, do miracles. And he was saying, I can't do miracles. You know? And they said, well, tell the future. And he would say, well, here's what I think is going to happen. And if it happened, then, oh, you're great. If it didn't happen, they, they turned on him. And so the, he developed this reputation, even though he didn't say it and didn't encourage it, that he could tell the future. When they tortured him, the only two things he confessed to was, one, I can't tell the future. Never said I could. And secondly, I sometimes have suffered from pride. And he says, if Peter could suffer, you know, could, could reject the Lord as he did, and then who am I to feel like I'm not going to be sinful as well, all right? So finally, they can't get anything legitimate or specific to blame him for or to accuse him of, so they declare that he's guilty generally of heresy and, schism and being a schismatic, okay? So they take him and two of his closest followers. The only mercy they show him is they hang them first and then they burn their bodies, and then they dump their bodies in the water. Um, years later, when the city of Rome was sacked by uh, Germans, there were a lot of people who said, this is the judgment for what, was, what happened to Savonarola. And there are still today people within the Roman Catholic Church who believe that he should be made a saint, mm -hmm. rather than having been accused falsely of being a heretic and hanged and burned that instead, he was one who truly, truly worked to reform the church from the inside in a very appropriate way. Now, he, he never gave in to political pressure. For instance, when he was made the abbot of St. Mark, Lorenzo de' Medici, who was in the favor of, you know, of the church, and he was the one who ran all of Florence, you know, the de' Medici family, Lorenzo the Great. Um, when he became the abbot, they said to him, you know, it's traditional that every new abbot goes and thanks Lorenzo uh, the great for their support of the monastery and for the fact that they're allowed to have this job. <laughs> and Savonarola's response was, I have this job because God gave me this job, and so I will go off into quiet and thank God, who's the one responsible. I will not thank Lorenzo. So he was not great at making friends, <laughs> but nothing I've ever read of him or studied of him suggests to me that he was wrong. You know? Yes? Is there a book that's written about him that is rather accurate? I, I can't answer that. I'm sure there, there, must, there probably is, but I, I don't know it. I think it would be very interesting. Yeah, it would be worth looking for. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, he was an ugly man. You know, you have paintings of him. <laughs> but I think he was right. And the point is, the reason why he's important when we talk about the lead up to the Reformation is there are examples, him being a, pr a particular one, of somebody within the church who was really trying to reform the church, who was trying to make the church what it should be, to get rid of all of the immorality, to get rid of all of the, the, the stupidness, to reestablish it as a place of spirituality. And he really worked very hard at that and got him killed. But there, were, there was a, a great sense. Wycliffe, Huss, Savonarola, many, many, many others. There, there also at that time was a, there grew up kind of a mystical movement as well. You may have heard of Meister Eichhardt, who was, uh, who was a German mystic who, um, his whole focus was on experiencing the presence of God in his life. Um, you have other mystics who come along at that time, um, two, two Flemish mystics, um, John of Reisbruck and uh, Gerhard Groot, who started a, a movement called the Devotia Moderna, the modern devotion, in which the whole thing was to focus a life of devotion on the life of Christ and the incarnation. Um, you probably have heard of Thomas Akempis' very famous devotional book, The Imitation of Christ. Well, Thomas Akempis really was in the school of the uh, modern devotion, or Devotio Moderna, which, um, which these Flemish mystics started. And The uh, Imitation of Christ is one of the most popular devotional books in history. You know, um, it's, 
I don't know that it's ever been out of print. You can pick one up in a bookstore anywhere. And so there, there, there was this growth of this sort of mystical sense of that the focus is on union with God and perception of God in my life in a very real way. Well, the problem with that with regard to the Catholic Church is that if you're focusing on my direct relationship with God, you're leaving out the Pope, and you're leaving out the bishops, and you're leaving out the priests. And so that, that too, became a foundation, a grounding for the Reformation, for the idea that there is a different way to do this than the way it's traditionally been done. You get uh, people like Juliana of Norwich, who was in the 14th century, 14th and uh, 15th centuries. She um, had visions later in life, had visions experiencing uh, Christ and the Virgin. And she spent the rest of her life in a cell with a window, and people would come and she would share her meditations on these visions she had of Christ. And again, this idea of a mystical relationship that grew out of um, a personal interaction and relationship with God, not mediated by somebody who was part of the formal church. So you get a lot of those kind of mystical movements as well. Um, any questions about any of that morass of things I'm throwing in? All yes. this mystical movement, how was it accepted by, of course not the Pope, but by the people in general? Was it just accepted as one of those things? Each of them had their own followings. Again, but you didn't, it's not like they could have a TV show and have people in you know, all 50 <laughs> no. states follow them. Uh, it had, it was, they were, most of the, they were localized. Like when I said that uh, Grosbach and Derut for, uh, and, and Groot were uh, Flemish, well, their mystical movement sort of was isolated to, the, to the, that area of the low countries and part of Germany. So very much localized, but the fact is that there were a lot of these different kind of mystical movements that people were keying into and saying, my direct personal relationship with God is more important than what the Pope says. And that's new. Okay, and that's all of these different pieces come together to sort of just prepare the ground for what's about to happen in 1517. Well, first part of the 16th century, sort of the, you know, the torch was lit in 1517 when Luther nails those 95 pieces to the door of the Wittenberg Cathedral, and then in the time following that, okay? But all of this, the, the real mess that the Catholic Church had made of things, and then all of the different movements, theological, philosophical, mystical, that came along, all of which were providing alternatives to the mess uh, that was the Catholic Church. And people were very open to that because they looked at that and goes, okay, this is this is not the right way to do it. There's got to be some different, some alternative to this. All right? Any other questions? Would Luther and say Stringley have read um, Puss and, and Yes, Wyckham? they would be, I mean both, um, particularly Luther was a very scholarly guy, you know. Um, so they would have been very familiar with their ideas. Um, in fact, Wycliffe in particular, I think Luther spoke very, very positively. Um, and so, yeah, they would have seen all of this as fodder for the thinking and the development of the doctrines of the Protestant Reformation from Luther on. Because again, they, one of the things that they did um, was they distributed their writings. You know, the, was, as I say, Wycliffe's writings went all the way from Oxford, England to Czechoslovakia, you know, and everything in between. And so they would have been readily available to Luther and others. So. Okay, folks, thank you very much. Thank you, Rob. Next week we talk about Luther and the actual story of the Reformation. Have a great week. Good weekend.